Um, we're now on to our TED style talk. So these are more high level talks and we have five of them. Uh, Dr. Vaibhav Patel will be moderating uh, these presentations. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. Uh, Vaibhav, you can take over. Thank you, Jennifer. That was, that was a wonderful session uh, and we are right on time. Um, so first of all, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to TED Style Talks. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm Vaibhav Patil and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, just a little bit uh, briefly uh, about uh, this particular session, uh, we call it TED Style Talks um, and they are inspired by, well, TED Talks. Uh, so in this session, we uh, ask all the participants to present a very high level overview of their research. Of course, science needs to be talked about, but we have specifically asked them to address, um, address a very high level uh, overview and uh, impact of the research. Um, each participant will be given five minutes and they have specific, specifically been asked to, uh, to limit their present to two slides that is in addition to the title slide. And there will be no question and answer at the end. But if you have any question uh, and if you should, uh, I highly recommend that you reach out to the trainees and, and uh, interact, connect with them later on. For the presenters, uh, this, will, uh, this will be the flow of the presentation. Uh, you will be made co-host and you can present your slides and start presenting. I will be timing it and I will use a thumbs up reaction just like uh, Sarah did uh, to indicate a four minute mark. And then I will use another thumbs up to gently, softly remind you that your time is over and, um, um, and then we can move on to the next presentations. Um, and I, uh, I would like to ask all the presenters and judges to keep their cameras on. And I would definitely uh, encourage participants to keep their cameras on as well, just to facilitate the uh, um, a bit more virtual, but bit more face-to-face uh, -face kind of uh, experience. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, I would like to ask all the participants to please put on their seat belts. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, exciting and uh, uh, amazing session. Um, so I think we can start uh, now. Um, first up is uh, Vishnu Vashantan. Um, uh, he's the graduate student within the uh, Libyan Institute and his title of the talk is Pericardial Injection of Micronized Matrix Biomaterial for, for Post-Infarct Cardiac Repair. Vishnu, you can take it over. Uh, thanks very much. Firstly, can everybody see my slide? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. So our lab has a minimally invasive solution to a massive problem. But first, let me start with the basics. After a heart attack or myocardial infarction, we need two things to save our patients' lives. The first thing we need is revascularization. This is giving blood back to damaged heart muscle. And the second thing we need is to ensure that the heart can heal in a healthy way. As a healthcare team, we have stents, we have bypass surgery. We're really good at the first thing, revascularization. But when it comes to long-term heart healing, we have a long way to go. The heart naturally tries to heal through a process called cardiac fibrosis. It replaces damaged muscle with, heart, uh, with uh, scar tissue, but eventually it stiffens and loses its ability to pump blood to the rest of the body. Patients go into heart failure and eventually they may even need a heart transplantation. Our lab has been on a decade long adventure to find biomaterials that we can use to enhance cardiac repair. And we've turned to extracellular matrix biomaterials because they have growth factors and come from natural tissue sources. We've also developed a surgical strategy where we can apply these biomaterials on the surface of the heart after myocardial infarction, and this is during open heart surgery. But now it's time to develop something that's minimally invasive. Pericardial injection is a less invasive and less traumatic strategy that we can use to enhance cardiac repair with biomaterials. An ultrasound is used to guide the placement of a needle or a catheter into the pericardial space that surrounds and houses the heart. A micronized particulate biomaterial is then injected into the pericardial space and it interacts with the heart to improve repair. This is a minimally invasive technique. There's no need for a big surgery. There's no need for a massive incision. So it allows us to become incredibly versatile. We can apply this th uh, therapy at many points early on 
before fibrosis takes over a patient's life. The patient can receive this therapy when they get an angiogram. Maybe they can receive it even by the bedside from a specialist. And we've also identified a biomaterial that's potentially compatible with this procedure. Interestingly, it's a micronized biomaterial that comes from the small intestine of a pig. It has growth factors that change the way the heart heals. It reduces scarring. Instead, it increases new blood vessel formation or angiogenesis. The reason angiogenesis is important is because it creates new channels of blood vessels that allow blood to reach damaged areas of the heart for cardiac regeneration. We have some preliminary results as well to show. In a small animal model after myocardial infarction, adding this biomaterial to the pericardial space increased the pumping function of the heart and also decreased ventricular stiffness, which is a direct sign that it's decreasing fibrosis. We also see things at a cellular level as well. The fibroblast is the culprit cell for cardiac fibrosis. And here we see a change in activity where the fibroblast is creating more FEDGAP. This is a compound that helps with new blood vessel formation. And when exposed to the biomaterial, it, the fibroblast also decreases its scarring fibrotic activity. So overall, what we see is improved cardiac function, and it all starts at a cellular level. We're also identifying components in the biomaterials that contribute to different things. Some components help with new blood vessel formation. Other components help with, uh, with, help with uh, reducing scar formation. And taken together and identifying these individual components and isolating them, we hope to one day make our own customized biomaterials. And we hope to tailor these biomaterials based on patient age, sex and gender, ethnicity, and their previous medical profile. Now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Heart attacks and myocardial infarctions, they occur in a wide variety of different settings and different types of presentations too. So having a minimally invasive versatile approach will allow us to tackle myocardial infarction and stop fibrosis before it takes our patients' lives and ruins their quality of life. We also hope to scale and make this procedure available to physicians and their healthcare teams. And finally, fibrosis is not just a pathway in the heart. It happens in many diseases in the heart and also in other organs in the body. So minimally invasive biomaterial therapy will allow us to improve the quality of life of our patients, both within and even beyond the cardiac sciences. Thank you all very much for your time. Wonderful, Vishnu, that was right on time. Thank you. So I guess as we don't have question and answer session, we will move on to the next presenter. Uh, that is Chantal Ritz. And uh, Chantal will be presenting on um, gynecological health in kidney disease. The end of a sentence, the start of a conversation. Great, can you hear me? Awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Chantal Ritz and today I'm pleased to talk to you about our work, gynecological health and kidney disease, the end of a sentence and the start of a conversation. Kidney disease affects gynecological health. If I showed you this sentence, would you be able to tell me what's wrong with it? As you frantically search for a misspelt word, let me advise you that the problem with this sentence is hard to catch. To some, it's completely overlooked and it may not be a big focus nor a big issue, but it is. Okay, how about I give you a hint? This sentence has a lot in common with females who live with kidney disease. Have you figured it out? The period is missing. Did you catch that? Was that the first thing you noticed or was that the last? Like this sentence, females with kidney disease face unrecognized gynecological problems, including missing periods, irregular periods, or early menopause. That period may mark the end of a normal sentence, but let it be the beginning of the conversation about gynecological health and kidney disease. Kidney disease is often thought of as a condition that mainly affects individuals in their older age whose fertility is long gone. However, this disease can affect our sisters and our daughters and our friends who are well within their reproductive years. You see the kidneys work to filter toxins and waste from our blood. And when the kidneys progressively lose function over time, as seen in kidney disease, they become less effective at preventing a buildup of toxins, which can thereby affect the menstrual cycle, causing irregular periods or even stopping them altogether. Now the relationship between kidney disease and periods is not exclusive, 
but instead both of these issues have significant effects on the cardiovascular system. We know that kidney disease increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and often complicates cardiovascular disease treatments and prognosis. Similarly, both irregular periods and earlier menopause are significant cardiovascular risk factors, highlighting the importance of addressing these issues in menstruating individuals. But what actually is the understanding of how kidney disease affects the menstrual cycle at the global scale? Do treatments for kidney disease like dialysis and kidney transplantation play a role in this relationship? Because of this, high, of this combination of high cardiovascular risk kidney disease and high cardiovascular risk menstrual disturbances, what cardiovascular threat do these females face? It seems like a highly relevant question to answer when almost 10% of the population worldwide lives with kidney disease and females are more likely to be affected than their male counterparts. So that brings me to my question and my project. I wanted to know exactly how many females like our sisters, daughters, and friends who live with kidney disease experience gynecological disturbances. Instead of completing my own study where I could have brought in 20 or so females who live with kidney disease, I instead took to the published literature looking to systematically summarize the global understanding of this relationship. Instead of 20 or so participants, I collected information on, on over 5,500 females living with kidney disease from almost 50 peer-reviewed articles representing over 25 different countries. In the end, the studies ranged from 1975 to 2020 and all came to the same conclusion. And what I found was truly shocking. Females with kidney disease who are on dialysis face significant menstrual disturbances where almost half experienced missing periods and a quarter experienced other menstrual irregularities. Similar results were found in females with kidney disease immediately prior to kidney transplantation. However, I found that months after a successful kidney transplantation, these females had significant improvements in the regularity of their menstrual cycle, increasing the number of females with regular cycles by over 30%. These findings have huge implications for how we think about kidney disease and the cardiovascular risk, especially in those who are still within their fertile years. Regaining a period may be the goal, but that period will not end the sentence nor the conversation about gynecological health and kidney disease. One in 10 Canadians lives with kidney disease. That's one in every 10 of your sisters, your mothers and friends who are facing a leading cause of cardiovascular related death. This project improves the understanding and awareness about these issues and can in turn be used for timely and targeted approaches to improve both kidney and cardiovascular health in this population. Thank you. Right on time. Thank you, Chantal. Um, next up is Kate Bourne. Uh, Kate, if you can uh, share your screen. Um, Kate will be talking about female patients with postural tachycardia syndrome, POTS, have reduced quality of life compared to male patients. You can take it over. Great, so I'm just gonna check that everyone can see the screen and hear me. Great. You may have heard that females having heart attacks are more likely than males to be misdiagnosed and are sadly also more likely to die. Heart attacks are primarily viewed through a male lens and the differences in symptoms in female patients are often missed. But what if we looked at a cardiac condition that primarily affected female patients? We might expect females to have better treatments and better recognition of symptoms because this is a disorder that primarily affects them, right? Well, actually, no. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, the disorder I am studying, primarily affects female patients of childbearing age. In fact, over 90% of patients with POTS are female. Despite this, the diagnostic delay is almost two years longer in female compared to male patients. As well, female patients are more likely to be told that their symptoms are just all in their head, both before and even after POTS diagnosis. Would this be the case if POTS was a disorder that primarily affected males? An interesting question, but one we don't know the answer to. So what exactly is POTS? POTS is an autonomic nervous system disorder. The autonomic nervous system can be thought of like the automatic nervous system. Things that you don't think about like how fast your heart is beating, your breathing, your body temperature and digestion are all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. 
But unfortunately, in patients with POTS, this system is not working properly. When a person stands up, gravity pulls blood from the chest into the abdomen and legs. In a healthy person, the autonomic nervous system responds and blood vessels in your body squeeze more tightly to help push this blood back up to the heart. In POTS patients though, this response is not normal and the blood vessel squeezing doesn't happen properly. So the heart has to beat very quickly to make sure that there is enough blood getting to all areas of the body. Specifically, when patients with POTS stand up, their heart rate increases by 30 beats per minute or more without a decrease in blood pressure. In addition to this increased heart rate when standing, patients have debilitating symptoms like lightheadedness, chest pain, shortness of breath, and nausea. This happens every single time a patient with POTS stands up and lasts for the entire duration of standing. Think about this, we live in a standing world. What would it be like for you if you were unable to stand for more than a few moments? Everyday activities like going to the grocery store or chasing after your children in the park or standing in a line, these become impossible for patients with POTS. This is their everyday reality. So you might be thinking, why don't POTS patients just sit down? Wouldn't that help? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. In addition to feeling horrible when standing, patients with POTS have symptoms that extend to many areas of their lives. Things like fatigue, difficulty thinking, headaches, as well as allergy and stomach problems are common. In fact, these symptoms are so debilitating that many patients are unable to work or go to school. A survey found that 70% of patients had actually lost income due to the severity of their POTS symptoms. Because of the disparities between males and females in POTS, I decided to look at sex differences in quality of life. This research comes from the Diagnosis and Impact of POTS study, which was a large survey of over 7,000 patients with POTS. We used the RAN36 health-related quality of life survey to look at quality of life in these patients. One score that you can calculate from, survey, from this survey is called the composite score. We calculated physical health, mental health, and overall health-related quality of life scores from this data. Shown here are these composite scores. A higher number or bigger bar indicates that the quality of life was better, and a smaller number or shorter bar indicates that the quality of life was worse. We can see that for the physical health and overall health composite scores, quality of life was lower in female patients. But in the mental health composite scores, the quality of life was not different. We don't know for sure why the quality of life is lower in female patients, but we have some ideas. The first is that the diagnostic delay is almost two years longer in females compared to males. This could lead to a treatment delay, which may reduce quality of life. Second, we know that female patients with POTS are more likely to be diagnosed with other medical conditions related to POTS. The increased burden of these other medical conditions may be reducing quality of life. This is just the beginning of our understanding of sex differences in POTS. We now know that females experience more challenges with diagnosis and also have reduced quality of life compared to male patients. Significantly more work is required to increase awareness and recognition of POTS. However, recently POTS has gained some new attention. You may have heard of people experiencing long COVID or persistent symptoms for many months after COVID infection. Interestingly, many of the symptoms of long COVID actually overlap with the symptoms of POTS. Although it is very unfortunate that so many people are struggling with these debilitating post-COVID symptoms, it is increasing awareness and research funding for all patients with POTS. Thank you, Kate. Uh, that was right on time. Um, next, we have Kayla Turino Miranda. Um, and uh, Kayla will be presenting on cardiovascular risk and route of estrogen administration in transgender women, a systemic review and meta-analysis. Okay, can everyone see and hear me? Okay, wonderful. Hi everyone, my name is Kila Trino Miranda and today I will be taking you through the journey of a physician who is looking to provide the best possible care for their new transgender patient. Here we have Emily. She was born biologically male. Throughout her life, she has experienced a phenomenon called gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is when a person's biological sex does not align with their gender identity. Because of this, Emily experiences severe gender incongruence, which causes her to seek her family physician. 
When speaking with her family physician, she aims to begin transitioning, which involves taking estrogen. This estrogen will allow Emily to develop female secondary sex characteristics, such as breast development. This estrogen, uh, so sorry, when speaking with her doctor, Emily reveals that she has a family history of cardiovascular disease and is looking to avoid medications which may further increase this risk. Her doctor presents many ways to deliver this estrogen, such as an oral pill or a patch. Taking Emily's cardiovascular history into account, this physician thinks back to how in biological females, this oral estrogen pill is associated with a higher cardiovascular risk. For this reason, Emily is prescribed the patch. What is the problem with this? As you may have noticed, decision-making is rooted in evidence-based research from the biological female population and not in the transgender women population. In their very nature, we see that the protocols for transgender care are not based on research done in transgender patients. What other population has this issue and gaps in knowledge? My study is a call to action. By systematically searching all the literature since 1946, I was able to look and see whether these studies looked at the route of estrogen administration, so the pill or the patch, and associated associated cardiovascular risk in transgender women. What did I find? Only five studies looked at the route of estrogen administration and none of those studies were looking primarily at cardiovascular risk. More importantly, a closer look at these studies demonstrated the major limitations in research and how the research community has much work to do in order to implement safe and effective protocols for transgender care. So what are the steps towards making these changes? Firstly, we need to implement appropriate stratification of estrogen hormone therapy use by dose, formulation, and route of administration. Additionally, appropriate control groups need to be implemented to ensure adequate quantification of cardiovascular disease progression, morbidity, and mortality. These changes accompanied by large cohort studies with sufficient follow-up time will allow for the advancement of clinical understandings and protocols. Again, why does this matter? I think the question is more, why wouldn't this matter? The transgender population is estimated to reach over 25 million worldwide. This growing yet medically underserved population are an increased cardiovascular risk and have a higher prevalence of heart attacks. There's an emerging need to assess the impact of hormone therapy on cardiovascular risk, but we need to be more specific. We can't simply look at the use of hormone therapy. We need to use a magnifying glass and look at how hormone therapy is being used. Only then will we be able to address the biased transgender patients experience in healthcare and mobilize change towards a future in which transgender care protocols will be created through evidence-based research. From what I've said thus far, you might be wondering why transgender women? Trans women are at the highest cardiovascular risk when compared to biological women, biological men, and transgender men. The use of estrogen hormone therapy may be what's conferring this increased risk in this population. Therefore, the results of my project will, um, sorry, um, the results of my project will promote cardiovascular health in trans women by providing both trans women and their healthcare providers with the information necessary to make decisions regarding estrogen hormone use. Like I said, current protocols for the care of trans women are based on research findings in the biological female population. This actively limits healthcare providers to guide treatment through referencing a different population with entirely different physiology. Therefore, this project champions the ability for future implementation of relevant protocols and thus further guides the advancement of cardiovascular health in transgender women. So let's go back to Emily. With all the changes I've mentioned and with the help of my study results, her physician would have a better understanding of the treatment options and how best to prevent medications, which may affect Emily's heart health in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Um, very, uh, very interesting project indeed. 
Um, just would like to remind everyone that these sessions are being recorded. So please smile, you're on camera. Uh, the last but not the least is um, Sanya Tariq. Um, Sanya, if you can share your screen while Sanya is walking down to the virtual floor. Her project or her talk is about exploring the self-management experience of people with type 2 diabetes in a subsidized healthy food prescription program. Sanya, you can begin. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys see my screen and hear me? Perfect. So good morning, everyone. I want you to imagine that you are a person living with diabetes and for whatever reason, your body's ability to regulate its blood sugar levels does not work like it's supposed to. Diabetes and its management are usually at the top of your mind. Now, you head to the grocery store after having finished work, and as you walk through the fresh produce, you stop and think to yourself, hmm, I wonder why these strawberries cost five times more than the strawberry jam in the aisle. And I swear that this bread and cheese get more expensive each year. As you dart through the aisles and look for the best deals, you remember that you need to head over to the pharmacy to pick up your medication, which comes to about $140 for this month. But by the time you reach checkout, you realize you do not have enough money to buy both your medication and your groceries. So you need to put something back. This time, you decide to put back some food and try your luck out at a community food bank. But between the shifts at work and helping the kids with their school, you can't find the time to make this trip. You make do with whatever food you have in your house and end up combining and skipping meals to make the food in your house last until your next paycheck. Most days, you feel anxious and trapped, especially since you feel like you are not in control of your blood sugars. Now, what if I were to tell you that that experience is the experience for 55,000 Albertans living with diabetes? Previous research has shown that one in five Albertans living with diabetes are not able to afford the food that they need. As a person with diabetes, the food that you eat is critical for regulating your blood sugar levels. Too much or too little of a certain food can cause your blood sugar levels to skyrocket or dip too low. Over time, you face long-term diabetes-related complications like blindness, lower limb amputation, and heart attacks. This high stress situation negatively impacts your health and makes managing your blood sugars impossible. Now you might be wondering, what are we doing about this? How can we support people who have diabetes but cannot afford the food that they need? Right now, the only resource we have are food banks, but they can only help so much since they don't provide the healthiest options and are often difficult to access. Our society really needs new ways to support people who have diabetes and can't access the food that they need. And this is exactly what my research intends to do. I want you to think of the phrase, let food be thy medicine. For many Albertans, the cost of medication is partially covered through various insurance plans. Imagine if we were to have that same attitude towards food, where people with diabetes could receive a food subsidy or a financial boost to buy the foods that they need in the grocery store. By providing people with diabetes the power to buy the food that they need, food subsidies have the possibility of changing the diabetes experience for many Albertans. But right now, we don't know if and how food subsidies work. So to answer these questions, my research team will be conducting a study with 400 Albertans who have diabetes and struggle to afford food. Half of the people enrolled into to this study will receive a six-month food subsidy to buy foods like fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy products, and grains at their local supermarket. Over the six months, we'll measure any changes in blood sugar levels and other measures of health to find out if food subsidies work for people with diabetes. Next, to understand how food subsidies work, I will talk to 30 people who have received the food subsidy at the end of the six months. While having a conversation with them, I wanna understand their experiences and explore possible ways in which the food subsidy impacted their ability to manage their diabetes and possibly lead to changes in their diet and their blood sugar levels. By answering the question of how around food subsidies, we'll be better equipped to improve its design and possibly introduce it to new communities in Alberta and elsewhere. To wrap up, people with diabetes face many challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. 
not having enough food or the right type of food should not be one of those challenges. The research we plan to conduct on food subsidies will provide us with the information we need to make them a reality. And so that the next time I ask you to imagine that you are a person with diabetes in the grocery store, you don't have to make the decision between skipping fresh fruit for the stuff in the aisles. You don't have to make the choice between your medication and your food. And you're not as stressed about having to choose between putting food on the dinner table and managing your diabetes. Thank you. Thank you, Shania, that was right on time. Um, so I guess that brings us to the end of this session. Um, I'm kind of feeling lucky that I'm moderating that, this session and not judging it. This, this is a wonderful science that we do at the Living Institute. The breadth of science was, was amazing to see. And I'm, I'm really impressed with all the five presenters and the difficult job is for the judges to pick the, pick the presentations that were, that were the best. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, this, this brings us to the close of this session. I will hand it over back to um, Jennifer, I suppose. And uh, thank you all once again.